and welcome. Today, the man who drew back the curtain and revealed just how closely Big Brother is watching us, Edward Snowden. We'll hear from the former NSA contractor and from other speakers at the Personal Democracy Forum, the tech activist conclave recently held here in New York. Also on our broadcast, Erasing the Internet, Europe's right to be forgotten ruling. Is it a victory for privacy or for censorship? And in our public intellectual segment, where we look at new research with the power to change our minds and public policy, we ask, does voting along ethnic lines truly serve the ethnic voter? First, though, the 11th annual PDF, the Personal Democracy Forum, which attracted hundreds of tech-savvy political activists from all over the world on June 5th and 6th. Edward Snowden was the keynote speaker and a hero to most there. The documents he leaked revealed that the NSA, the National Security Agency, was collecting the phone records of millions of Verizon customers and has the power to track our bank transactions, text messages, YouTube views, Facebook likes, email chats, web browsing data, and more. His leaks also exposed CIA intercepts in Iran, CIA tracking of the Taliban, and computer hacking in China. Snowden has been charged with violating the Espionage Act. And since he is a wanted man living in Russia, he spoke to the PDF via video link. We edited this conversation to run about 15 minutes. Essayist and cyber libertarian John Perry Barlow moderated, first asking Snowden how, the fra how he frames the whole issue of government surveillance. It's the, the question of are we protecting the nation or are we protecting the state? And that's the nation a, very, that's a very good way of putting country. it. Exactly. It reflects us, you know, our, our way of life, our shared values. And if we're, you know, destroying those values, if we're sort of trying to burn down the village in order to save it, are we really making progress? Is that what America is all about? You know, I don't think we should have to go around uh, before we send a text message or we carry a cell phone or we make a purchase or, you know, we, we say goodnight to somebody we love, uh, that we have to think about what that's going to look like in a government database tomorrow or a year from now or five years from now. And the fact that they've got data collection going back five years or more with a waiver uh, should be a concern to every American. Well, one of the things that people have a different, especially oddly enough in the, the intelligence agencies, uh, have a difficult time with is the difference between data and information. And you know this difference. It, it's a profound difference. Right. I mean, you can think about uh, one of the biggest debates we've seen over the last year in government circles has been about metadata. They've said, you know, metadata, all of this signaling information about where we go, who we met, you know, who we called, how long it took, you know, all the time we spend doing these different activities in our lives. Metadata is a comprehensive record of what we do and really who we are. And the defenders of sort of mass surveillance, the defenders of suspicionless surveillance, have told us it's nothing to worry about, it's not that serious, because it's not the actual uh, words that we're speaking on the call. It's just everything else about our entire lives. But something that's amazing that's happened in this, this same year is that the government itself has started to abandon that. Michael Hayden, former director of the CIA and the NSA, literally admitted to a reporter, we kill people based on metadata. Yeah. That's it. You know, uh, that's, that's right. extraordinary. Stuart Baker, the former general counsel of the and, NSA, and an old he said metadata tells you everything about yeah. a person. And he's right. Yeah. That's what people, you know, that's what we've all come to see, is if the government is collecting metadata without a warrant, they're collecting everything about everyone. And what does that mean for our society as we go forward? Well, it could, you know, it could mean nothing. Uh, well, it means something in any event, but it could mean relatively little as long as the judgments that are made about that information, uh, as long as the motivation for seeking certain kinds of information and winnowing that out of the data as opposed to other kinds, is, is transparent and well understood by everybody who is being surveilled. But we really need to think about what we want to allow uh, the rules of play to be in society, not just for governments, but for everyone. Uh, and, you know, there's an organization um, of, of academics and specialists, experts on surveillance policies and human rights around the world who have been working 
uh, extensively on this. And last year they proposed something called the International uh, Principles on the Application of Human Rights to Communication Surveillance. And it's called the 13 Principles. And basically it boils down to any information that's collected and used uh, has to be used for purposes that are necessary and proportionate to sort of the case that we're encountering. Uh, in the government's uh, examples, it would be things like you can't monitor an entire country uh, because you're worried about a few criminals. Uh, that's not proportionate to the threat, and it's certainly not necessary. Um, for uh, companies, it would be similar things. If you are collecting information for advertising or for monetizing your service, you have to only collect that information which is absolutely necessary for those business purposes and only retain it for the bare minimum of time necessary to achieve those purposes, not sort of collect these global profiles on everybody who uses your service, your email address books, who you talk to, how long you talk to, and things like that, because that's going beyond what's necessary, right? And it creates a dangerous situation that uh, academics have described as databases of ruin, where basically when you aggregate so much information about people, regardless of where it's at, whether the government's holding it, whether the telecommunications companies are holding it, or whether advertisers are holding it, the temptation to abuse it is simply too great for anybody to resist over time. There, there's also, I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, when I first got around computing, uh, I found that there was something seductive about an empty field in a database. <laughs> it was completely irrational, but I would, even though, Filling in that field was probably of no particular relevance. I would go to some trouble to make sure that that was smoothly filled in. And I think that you have an entire culture that does that. Uh, and now, you know, there, that culture has suddenly been given tools that make it trivially easy to do that in every instance. Uh, right. I mean, when we think about it from the, the technical perspective, you know, uh, technologists, engineers, we like to solve problems, and we like to see how far the system goes. And we see we have access to data. We want to collect it because otherwise it's wasted. Why not? Um, but something that uh, President Obama said over the last year when he was caught, for example, spying on Angela Merkel, was just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. And that applies to, you know, all of these programs. Sometimes that field in the database needs to be left unfilled because the risk of filling it is far greater than the benefit of doing so. And that's something that worldwide we need to institute principles. It would be greatly to their benefit if people knew exactly what they were like, exactly what they could do, exactly what they can't do, and exactly what they have a conscience about. I mean, they are endowed with, with uh, both capacities and evil intent in those capacities that is awe-inspiring but false. There's, there's certainly a line, right? Because where we don't need to know the names of every target, we don't need to know every intelligence operation out there, we need to know the broad outlines of the authorities that governments have granted themselves. And particularly when it comes to things like the most senior officials in our intelligence community lying under oath in, on camera to everybody in the country, that has a tremendous effect because suddenly we realize it's no longer a question of you know, who do we trust, uh, who do we elect, who do we vote for, but can we elect anyone? You know, do they really represent our interests when officials can make promises about reforms and then violate those promises, violate that faith that the public invested them with in our votes and face no consequence, face no accountability. And this is one of the reasons that I think we see uh, these, these tremendous efforts being made today. I, I read just today uh, that Google, has uh, rolled out a new end-to-end -end encryption plugin for Gmail as part of the Reset the Net campaign. And this is a key, right? The Reset the Net campaign is going, you know, we need legal reform. We need Congress to step up and reform these things. But we're past the point where citizens are entirely dependent on governments to defend our rights. We don't have to ask for our privacy. We can take it back. Yes. We can use our technology, apply it in new and innovative ways. The only reason that the NSA allowed strong cryptography to be, to be uh, used freely was because EFF came in and proved that it was a form of speech. And they were exercising prior restraint. 
Right. I mean, how do we stop? How do we stop the the juggernaut, the Leviathan, the the beast? So we need to we need to have a comprehensive a comprehensive response to sort of the the failure of institutions domestically and not just domestically but internationally. Yeah. Right. The reason government exists is to represent and champion the public interest. It seems pretty obvious to I think most people here. Uh, that there are a lot of corporate interests that are creeping in, there are a lot of political interests creeping in uh, to government agendas that don't represent public needs. And that's a concern because some people go, well, how do we respond? I'm going to vote with my dollars. You know, I'm going to donate to this group or the other group, and that's good. Right. But you can't stop. You can't wash your hands when you donate money to the ACLU or the EFF or any of these other groups, even though that's necessary. Because when it comes to a fight of dollars, right, uh, they have more than we do. Lockheed Martin has more money than you do. Boeing has more money than you do. Uh, you know, Booz Allen Hamilton has more money than you do. But they only get one vote, the same as you do, right? So everybody here needs to remember that we have to vote. You know, we've got a congressional election this year, and we did not just vote, we need to campaign against people who aren't representing the public interest. Because at the end of the day, their job is to represent us. And if they're not doing it, if they're representing Lockheed, if they're representing Boeing, they need to find a new job. And, and, and the first step, really, frankly, Ed, is, is having, I wish there were more, but having somebody like you who is capable, willing, and smart enough and clear enough to stand up and say, I have had enough and I'm not going to take it anymore, and, and this is what's wrong with it, and this is why it has to stop. And, you know, I, I hate the fact that you are practically alone in this. We are doing our best to, to proliferate your kind, but I'm very grateful for the one that we've got. Very you know, I, I appreciate the compliments, but the reality is I didn't do anything special. It's critical to remember that. What I did was a civic duty, right? What I did was what all of us would do, I believe, in the same situation. If you are sitting at my desk and, you know, you see the massive systemic violation of our Constitution and the public doesn't know about it, you know, what would you do? It's, it's, it's a challenge, but we have to step up on a broad basis. We have to say, you know, I'm not special. I'm not, you know, this right. super genius. I'm not uh, particularly morally gifted versus the common man. This is about all of us. This You're is about brave. us standing up and saying what kind of country we want to live in. You're brave, though. And, and you're brave, and you're not pretending to be asleep. You know, the, the, the Navajo have a wonderful saying, which is that you can't awaken somebody who's pretending to be asleep. And, <laughs> you know, and that, that describes that. a very large percentage of the uh, American public at the moment. Uh, they're playing possum. A, a lot of this comes down to the, the fact that we don't like to rock the boat about things we don't see affecting us personally. Um, and that's the reason that a lot of people don't go out and campaign against all of these, you know, political problems, against all of these things that do affect us, but in a way that they don't see directly because it hasn't hit them yet. The real problem is when you do that in terms of surveillance, when you do that in terms of mass surveillance, when you do that in terms of your constitutional and your human rights, these are rights that you often never get to claw back because once the government grants itself an authority, it's loath to give that up. Yeah. And when we give them a database of all of our human lives, all of our activities, who we love, what we think about, what we look up on Wikipedia, and we let them hold that forever and ever as, as time goes on, when we let them build these massive data spanners to build these sort of domains of data about our domestic lives, uh, we might trust this president we might trust this Congress. We might think today's director of national intelligence is the most moral man in the universe. But what happens after the next election right. and the next election and the next election? It's a system of turnkey tyranny that we've allowed to be built. Well, actually, we didn't allow it to be built because we were never asked for our consent. But it has been built in secret, behind closed doors, and now we're living with it. The question is, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, and that is the question. And I'm, unfortunately, that is... All we have time to ask is that question. 
but I hope that question will ring in everything we do here over the next couple of days and, and in everything we do. I mean, the United States of America, such as it exists, exists to ask that question and to answer it right. And, and God bless you, Ed Snowden, for helping us answer it. Just say one one last thing. You know, when I when I look over the last year, you know, I I had to give up a lot to do what I did. Uh, and my biggest fear was that you know nobody would care, nobody would talk about this. Right. But this this the people in this room today, the conversation that we're having shows how wrong I am, or how wrong I was. And you know, I'm so thankful for that. I think it's critical because it shows the fact that we're not going to turn the page on massive systems violating the Constitution and things like that overnight. It never happens, right? Government doesn't turn the boat immediately. But the fact that we're talking about this, the fact that you are talking about this, the fact that people care shows that we will get a better and more accountable government. You know, and while all I did was I returned information to public hands that never should have been kept from the public in the first place. Yeah. It's up to you guys to end this conversation. And, uh, you know, seeing this level of support just encourages me that you will. And I've got to thank you for that. When, as, as, as... Edward Snowden speaking to the 11th Annual Personal Democracy Forum here in New York in early June. There were other notable speakers at the PDF, including blogger and co-founder of Global Voices Online, Rebecca McKinnon, a former CNN reporter in Japan and China. She sees fighting government overreach as job one for today's generation of activists, both here in the U.S. and in highly repressive countries such as China. This is edited to about six minutes. Actually, on this date, June 5th, the day after the Chinese military gunned down protesters in Tiananmen Square, this photograph was taken. This photograph, when shown around college campuses recently by an author of a book called The People's Republic of Amnesia, um, she, she showed the photograph to about 100 students, only about 15 recognized it. That's how effective, even in the internet age, the Chinese government has been in really erasing the public memory of what happened. And, of course, with the help of internet companies, they're highly dependent on capital from places including Wall Street and Sand Hill Road uh, for, for their success. Um, but on a more optimistic note, sticking with 25 years ago, 1989, this is a photograph from Poland. Most of the Iron Curtain crumbled in 1989. Uh, and uh, what's really interesting, since 1989, there's been a predominant narrative in American policymaking, foreign policymaking, and in the media about kind of the way the world is going. That you have authoritarian countries kind of on one side, and you know, you've got the, the democracies on the other, and that Inexorably and inevitably, particularly thanks to technology, they're all going to sort of end up over with us, more like us. That's, that's been the narrative. But what we've learned, I think, what's really been brought home to us uh, by our friend Ed Snowden, is that we're really in danger of meeting in the mi middle. And, and as we heard from Emily Parker this morning, yes, it's true that authoritarian countries are getting a little more pluralistic, people are feeling a little more empowered thanks to technology. But we're really in danger of meeting the authoritarian countries in a really unpleasant, not very free middle if we don't do something. 
And that's, that's, I think, what Ed Snowden has really taught us. So what do we do? How do we move out of this kind of bad trend that we really woke up to find ourselves in a year ago, although there have been many people in this room who've been kind of yelling and screaming and warning about it for many, many years previously, you know, thanks to the EFF who've been suing for a decade and so on. Uh, but uh, how, do we, how do we ensure that we can even know when abuses of power are taking place, let alone constrain that power and hold it accountable to the public interest? Now, there have been a lot of people over the past year calling for Magna Cartas and Bills of Rights for the Internet Age, and, but actually people have been writing Bills of Rights and Magna Cartas for the Internet really for the past decade, and, and this page here is a list that a, a group called Best Bits compiled of all the various kind of communiques and codes and, and, and declarations of Internet rights that have been generated really for, for, the, for the past decade. But the thing is that principles and declarations, I mean, they're not all that easy. You know, you, you kind of, you know, have a mailing list and you fight about it for a little long time. But that, that is the easy part. That's way easier than actually bringing about change. Because you can have principles, you can articulate how the principles translate to the internet, but now how do you actually hold those with power accountable? Not just get them to commit, but get them to do it and hold them accountable to it. That is, of course, the challenge that we're facing. Now, a lot of people here are activists, are part of what we call civil society, part of sort of the nonprofit activism community. Civil society needs to build strong alliances with the business community and, in, and with the world of professional politics. And it is in that sweet spot in the Venn diagram when you get the alliances between civil society, business, and politicians, and politics and government, that's where the lasting change happens. That's where you really move the dial. Uh, two and a half years ago, it already feels like a million years ago, um, many people in this room were involved with the de defeat of the Stop Online Piracy Act and its evil twin, Pippa. Um, and what, what, was, what was key to that defeat? There was certainly the network public sphere, but there were also strong allies amongst major powerful corporations and strong allies in government who saw it in their interest to get behind this. And that's what really brought about that victory. We also had, sort of on the international sphere, the International Telecommunications Union, a part of the UN, uh, in late 2012, kind of made a bid to assert more jurisdiction over internet governance. It was stopped, at least for the time being, primarily due to the fact that there was an alliance, not just activists raising hell, but also very strategic alliances between the global activist community different members of government in different countries, and key companies that really got that stopped, and it took all three together. But saying no is the easy part. What do you do about undoing the entrenched surveillance industrial complex that has been woven into the fabric of government, government and corporations for the past decade or so? That's, that's the hard part blogger and co-founder of Global Voices Online, Rebecca McKinnon, addressing the PDF, the Personal Democracy Forum, here in New York in early June. So if Americans are concerned about losing our freedom and privacy, Europeans appear more so. In May, the highest court in the European Union ruled that search engines like Google must delete links from their results if a person claims the information is inadequate, irrelevant, or no longer relevant. The ruling stemmed from a Spanish case where a name search kept linking to a man's property being seized for taxes, even though it happened 16 years ago. So how's the right to be forgotten working so far? How's Google handling it? And how come Europe 
is in the forefront of this. Joining us via Skype from Newport Beach, California, Danny Sullivan, Editor-in-Chief of SearchEngineLand.com, a blog that covers search engine marketing and news. And on the phone from Paris, James Q. Whitman, Professor of Comparative and Foreign Law at Yale University. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Professor Whitman, uh, does this law mean that if I lived in Paris or Madrid or somewhere, I could have those embarrassing pictures of me taken in college taken down? Well, that's certainly what the French hope is the case. I think you'll have to ask your other guests how well it really works. I'm not a specialist on the, on the efficacy of this kind of regulation of the Internet, and all Americans are naturally skeptical that it could work, but boy, the French care. Danny, would it be for that kind of prosaic use? Uh, potentially it is, although it won't actually take the pictures down. It'll just take the links from Google and other search engines leading to the pictures down. And the, the courts seem to feel like that will effectively make it invisible. But if someone else knew where the photos were or maybe found a search engine where uh, it wasn't forced to forget this information, then, then the pictures would still be available. So, Professor Whitman, why do the French and other Europeans care so much? Well, the Europeans, at least the continental Europeans, the English are a different story, uh, but, but the continental Europeans think of privacy in a very different way from the way Americans do. They think of the protection of privacy as an aspect of the protection of their personal honor uh, and of their control over their public image. Uh, we have very little of that sort of idea in American law. Honor is not a protectable interest, and of course in American culture, we think of honor as something kind of to snicker at, whereas the Europeans really take it quite seriously. Uh, and, of course, it can be very damaging to one's personal honor to have embarrassing information from the past available, easily available online. Danny, do you see this as a culture clash where Europeans value honor in the way Professor Whitman was describing it, while Americans maybe more value transparency? Um, I don't know if it's so much the honor aspect, but certainly Europeans seem to have a higher regard that there should be more private information and less information that's collected about individuals. And that was one of the key things in the European Union's ruling on this, is that it wasn't that the court said this is somehow causing people to have their private information exposed, but rather that it viewed the search engines as somehow collecting data about people and making that too easily accessible. And the Europeans especially seem to be much more sensitive to the idea of, of, of giant data collection things that can figure out information about individuals. What if these things are true, Professor Whitman? What if that guy's property was seized for lack of payment in taxes? And what if it was six years ago instead of 16 years ago? Or what if it was 16 days ago? How much of that matters to people? Well, ordinarily in European law, truth doesn't count as a defense in the way that it does in some aspects of American law. It's quite complicated, I'm sure. You don't want to hear all of the details. Um, but again, it's perfectly possible uh, uh, for your personal honor, for your standing in society, to be impaired if embarrassing facts, true or not, are revealed about you. And European law is quite sensitive to that. Uh, I should say, uh, uh, I should agree with what, what Danny just said. The Europeans are indeed very concerned about big corporations collecting information. That's another very important difference. We tend to think in the last analysis of the government as the great enemy of our privacy. The Europeans really worry about the media and about private corporations much, much more than Americans tend to do. It's funny because one um, could look to uh, George Orwell and, you know, the memory hole uh, as kind of an opposite ex example of what Brits, at least, Europeans in that respect, may have had to be afraid of. Well, you know, Europeans often will say that, that the reason they're so concerned about privacy, Germans will say this, is that they're reacting against the horrors of the Nazi period. In fact, I think a little bit of careful history shows that that's not true. These concerns long predate the Nazis uh, in Europe. These have to do with much, much older cultural tendencies that in some ways were actually reinforced during the Nazi period. So I'm a skeptic about that kind of claim, that kind of explanation of European concerns about privacy. So, Danny, from your understanding, is Google getting many de-linking requests? Um, they seem to be getting about 10,000 per day. Um, that was the, the number that was given out in the first week. So whether that's diminished or changed, we don't know yet because they haven't given any fresh. How, how fresh do you view that number? That sounds like a lot to me compared to zero, but is 10,000 a day a lot? It's significant, but it's not the 
the the fear factor that you know Google kind of suggested that everything would grind to a halt when millions of individuals would suddenly demand to have this stuff down. When you when you consider the amount of people there are that have information in Google, it's still kind of relatively nothing. Is it possible for you to discern who is tending to ask for links to be taken down and for what reasons? Google did a breakdown where uh, they group them by different kinds of categories and I, I don't have the stats up in front of me um, but you know the the chunk if I recall the biggest chunk was something like around 12 percent if I remember correctly uh, that were people who were convicted of some kind of violent crime and then there was like another 12 percent or so of people who were like misdemeanors and there were like six percent of people who were uh, if I remember again the numbers correctly I'll try to pull them up but like pedophiles and um, or, or that had been convicted of that you had like three percent that were like celebrities and then I think like two percent that might have been politicians. So, it, it, the the mostly it were people who had uh, criminal convictions that didn't want that information available when people searched for them in the search results. Also, interestingly, by far the biggest request came out of Germany. By far, I mean, even when you adjust by the population of countries, because the second largest country in, in the EU was France, and they were like at the far lower end of the uh, of the list. Why Germany? Is it clear? My understanding had been that, you know, Germans had kind of reacted to things that happened, um, you know, back during the Cold War and when you had the East German countries spying on everybody, that they were especially sensitive to the idea of privacy issues. That's, that is just sort of what I'd heard, and so I deferred to our other guest on that. But, you know, for whatever reason, Germans seem to be very concerned about privacy issues. And so, Professor, to you on the same question, why Germany? Any knowledge, any theories? Well, you know, you do indeed see an awful lot of this kind of concern in German culture and in, in German law. I can only say once again, dating very, very far back into the 19th century. Uh, Germans are very much attached to their personal honor, and the law in question in particular has been very deeply associated historically with German dueling law. These are things that go very, very far back. As for criminal convictions, publication of information about criminal convictions is already very much restricted in Europe, much more than it is in U.S. law. Names and photos of accused persons are not published, and in fact, even of convicted persons. There's a lot of concern, which again is framed in terms of personal honor, about protecting the social standing even of persons with criminal convictions. Whereas, of course, in America we do things like perp walks, which are shocking and unimaginable to Europeans who think it violates the presumption of innocence. Perp walks, the police walking, somebody who's been arrested for something in public, say from a police car into the police station or the courtroom, you and better. the networks, the TV stations are invited to follow with cameras and everybody else with still photos. But the um, data that Danny was citing, if this is mostly people with criminal records, is that uh, now, I, or let, let me clarify because I'm sorry sure. to interrupt, but I, I pulled up the stats. So about one third were people who had some kind of a fraud or scam incident that they wanted removed. Either they were convicted of it or something was being alleged. Then about another third were people that are involved in some kind of a crime situation. Uh, Twenty percent of those were violent or serious crimes, and then twelve percent of those were people involved with child pornography arrest removal. So it seemed to be split between businesses worried that they're going to be sort of like people think that they're a fraud, and then the the criminal aspect as well. Gosh, Danny, in this country, the legal battles tend to go in the other direction. Like if somebody was convicted of child molestation or rape or something like that, that their names are forced onto databases that people can search before, you know, that person has rented an apartment or anything like that. Yeah, that's um, very distinctively American. Other countries don't permit that, that they kind don't. of thing at all. So, so, Professor, when these stats that Danny was just citing get out, there isn't a reaction around Europe as, oh, gosh, this is the criminal lobby, and they just want a big one in court and have a little reaction to what they've been supporting in, in the first place or not really? Well, gee, I'm, the, I'm, I'm hearing the stats for the first time myself, and I don't know how Europeans will react, of course. But as I say, this kind of law has been around in Europe for a very, very long time. It's critical, centrally important for the development of German privacy law, for example, uh, a lot of which grew up out of a case protecting the privacy of a convicted criminal. No matter how much the general public may object, the legal profession tends to defend these, these rules very, very vigorously in these countries, and I expect they do it again. Uh, but we'll see. So if we thought that America was the place where people come to reinvent themselves, maybe it's really Europe. 
Uh, there are a lot of other <laughs> difficulties, obstacles in the way of reinventing yourself in Europe, I think. Uh, um, Danny, what actually happens if I search for somebody or something on Google and a link has been taken down under this law? What would I see? Well, it, it hasn't actually happened yet. So when it does, even, not even for the person who this whole thing began about, <laughs> uh, when it happens, what will likely be the case is, let's say you were somebody in the UK and you asked that when you search for your name that the second link was something you objected to and you wanted it removed. If Google agreed with that and decided to remove it, then when people searched for your name, that link would no longer appear. Mm -hmm. However, at the bottom of the page, there would be a notice that something was removed. And, and it's likely that notice will say something like, uh, we received a right to be forgotten request on this, and click here and you could see the information that tells you more about it. And then you would likely click on a link that'll probably take you over to a site called Chilling Effects, which would then most likely show you a copy of the letter with all the stuff blocked out that would tell you what the query was um, or what the actual link was or whatever, but it would give you some sense that there was a particular request that came in. This is how Google handles censorship, for example, when it happens in the United States, when they have to remove something for copyright infringement, they link over, link over to the copyright demand that they receive so that people understand what happens there. And, and, and finally, that would only happen if you searched on Google Co.uk, which is the Google UK website. It would also happen if you did that search um, on any European Union version of Google, say Google.fr, which is Google France. If you went to Google.com, even in the UK, the, the link will still be there. Uh -huh. And, and it also none of the removals would happen for people who are in the US. So, Professor Whitman, we have 30 seconds left, but after Edward Snowden and everything, do you think Americans are now going to become more like Europeans on this, more protective of our privacy? It would amaze me. But in any case, we conceive our privacy very, very differently from the way the Europeans do. So what we protect is very unlikely to be the same thing in the last analysis, I believe. All right. To all our viewers in Europe, quick, Google Danny Sullivan, James Whitman, uh, BrianLaird.tv before somebody <laughs> takes it down. And thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. And staying with the subject of freedom and the power of the Internet, Let's hear one more voice from the 11th Annual Personal Democracy Forum. The final speaker at the two-day June conference here in New York was Clay Shirky, NYU writer in residence and author of the books Cognitive Surplus and Here Comes Everybody. Shirky noted that the tech activist movement had matured since the first PDF gathering 10 years ago. More participants are now involved with organizations with long-term goals, but he cautioned, don't mature too much. This talk is edited to about eight minutes. I have, I assure you, nothing to say that could possibly sum up uh, a conference this diverse and this amazing. Uh, but I have been thinking a lot about one of the themes that's come up over and over again, uh, which is time. Uh, so in, uh, in the summer of 2010, Voina, the Russian art collective, learned that Vladimir Putin was going to have a meeting in St. Petersburg. And so they went to a nearby bridge the night before, and they painted a giant penis on the bridge. And you couldn't really see it, because of course, driving along, you can't really tell you know, what's, what's, what's at eye level. But the next morning, when the bridge, which was a drawbridge, rose <laughs> directly across the street from the FSB, the inheritors of the KGB, which was Putin's alma mater, it was a nice gesture. Uh, <laughs> Yesterday, the Electronic Frontier Foundation released a document, uh, released a, 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 an article that said, here are 65 things we didn't know about NSA surveillance this time last year. Uh, they'd been working on it for weeks. Of course, it was based on a year of reporting on the Snowden revelations. And the Electronic Frontier Foundation, and I had to look this up, it surprised me, the Electronic Frontier Foundation has been around for 25 years. So here are two time signatures. One is the internet's native time signature of right now, and the other is the institutional time signature of a quarter of a century. Right? And as this community, as our tribe grows and matures, it's tempting to think that we should move the time signatures we operate at from the short term to the long term, away from Voina towards EFF. But I think that's wrong. I think what we should do is expand the window of the time signatures we can operate at because they work better when they work in tandem.
at the same, then there's a lesson to take from Occupy, from Occupy Wall Street. Anyone who was down in Zuccotti Park in the few weeks we held it recognized that there were two occupations going on at the same time. One was an explicitly political, externally focused occupation. It was people lining the edges of Zuccotti who'd made signs and were holding them up to show to the media and the American public. Signs that said things like, 99 to 1, those are good odds. But inside the park, there was a second occupation. It was implicitly political. It was internally focused. That was the occupation of the food tent, the comfort tent. That was the occupation of first aid and the beloved library. And when the Bloomberg administration cleared out the park by force, that was the occupation that turned out to have the staying power. So that when Sandy hit, it was the people who had been inside the park who reacted and became Occupy Sandy. Because what they'd gotten good at was suddenly taking care of a lot of people for a really long time. What we learned from the Occupy Wall Street movement, at least in its Zuccotti Park formulation, was that in America in the 21st century, taking care of people is a more radical act than holding up a sign. The Tahrir Square movement, uh, the, the broad arc of Tahrir Square was seizing a short-term advantage by a group of people who had trained for it for 10 years because the people who arranged January 25th had often worked together, many of them had worked together in the April 6th workers' movement, which had started in 2008. And many of those people had gotten to know and trust each other from the Kefaya movement, Kefaya meaning enough, a broad conversational movement of people united mainly by dislike of Mubarak and dislike of the regime, which had formed on the nascent Egyptian blogosphere a decade before. So there was a short-term action by a group of people who'd worked together or known each other for a decade. The broad arc of the Occupy Wall Street movement was people building up long-term capacity out of having seized this opportunity. And then within each of those two broad movements, there were lots of examples, long and short. Right. Now, it's tempting, as I said, to think we should be shifting the frame from short to long. But that, I think, undersells some of the advantage of sudden action. Right? We've been hearing for some not time now that clicktivism and slacktivism is ridiculous, it's stupid, how could you think that would work? But if it never worked, Brendan Eich would still have a job. Right? Eich was the, was the CEO of Mozilla, asked to step down because of his support for taking away the rights of same-sex couples to marry in California. It was a pure slacktivist movement. Right? It was an entirely virtual uprising. It was about public communication, and yet it worked. And sometimes, even when short-term defeat is absolutely assured, short-term action is what you need. Right? Putin was still very much in control of Russia. But Voina's actions and a thousand other public manifestations of one sort or another rob the incumbents, however incrementally, of the ability to insist that the seeming consensus of the Russian public is real. And that activity, even if it doesn't lead to revolution, is incrementally valuable. So the Personal Democracy Forum provides an annual snapshot. And one of the striking things about this event a decade ago was the number of people who were here as individuals who'd shown up because they thought that this sort of thing might come to matter. And when you look around now, you see so many people with name tags of organizations they founded or organizations they represent that are committed to that thesis right now. We are, as a tribe, as a community, this slice of it is institutionalizing. And yet I think we can't forget the lessons of complex movements like the Arab Spring, like Occupy Wall Street, which is that time signatures, various time signatures work better together. We need to think of time itself as a strategic weapon. Right? It's plain that the internet's native time signature is right now, and that it's difficult to build institutional capability, difficult but vital, as Zainab Tufeshi was talking about yesterday. But it's worth remembering that the strengths and weaknesses of different time signatures are different. Short term is good for surprises, but it's lousy for continuity. Long term is great for continuity, it's lousy for surprises. If you're in an institution, Ask yourself, what would happen if something on our issue 
forced us to react overnight, what could we do? Could you only issue a press release? Or could you also paint a bridge if you had to? If you're part of a ragtag group that's fighting for net neutrality because you know you're up against the September 10th deadline, ask yourself what you might do differently if you knew you'd be having that same fight over and over and over again for the next five years. If you're gonna pull a stunt, ask yourself what residue of human connection and trust will it leave? When people turned out in Tahrir Square, the social media that turned out to matter most for the physical occupation wasn't Facebook or Twitter. Those were good for broadcasting things nationally and internationally. The social media that mattered most was SMS. The biggest social media predictor of physical presence in Tahrir Square was whether your name was in the address book of the phone of someone already in the square. Right? Stunts that don't leave that residue of trust, that don't introduce people to each other in a way that exemplifies what Emily Parker wrote about in her recent book, Now I Know Who My Comrades Are. Those are indeed one-offs and they wash away quickly, but things that do leave a residue can be quite powerful. And if you're building an institution, ask yourself, for all the long-term thinking, what if we had to surprise the world tomorrow? What would we do? Because you might have to. We're going to need both time signatures. It'd be great if they work together. Thank you. In the 13th Congressional District, 83-year-old Charles Rangel is fighting to keep his seat in the June 24th primary. That's Tuesday. The district stretching from part of East Harlem and part of the Upper West Side up through Washington Heights and Inwood into part of the Bronx is 37% black and 52% Hispanic. The rise of that Latino share of the district and the decline of the black population in percentage terms is seen as a threat to the 43-year black incumbent. A recent poll, however, found Rangel with a 63-point lead among black voters, while Dominican challenger State Senator Adriano Espaillat holds a 27-point lead among the larger group, Latinos. The divide got ugly in the past couple of weeks as the candidates accused each other of bringing race into the primary, but one could argue that's exactly what voters themselves do generally as a matter of course. Vote for someone with a similar ethnic or racial background. But to sticking to your own kind give one a reliable ally in the halls of power once they are elected? That's the question before us in today's public intellectual segment where we look at new research with the power to change our minds and public policy. With answers, two scholars, Christina Greer, political science professor at Fordham University and author of Black Ethnics, Race, Immigration, and the Pursuit of the American Dream, and via Skype, Robert Preuss, political science professor at Metropolitan State University of Denver. He authored a study in Political Research Quarterly, that's the journal, entitled A Different Kind of Representation, Black and Latino Descriptive Representation and the Role of Ideological Cueing. That is an academic journal title. Professors, welcome to the program. Hello. Thank you. Great to see Thank you. you. And um, Professor Price, what was your research? What were you setting out to study? What research question were you looking to answer? Well, you know, it's really part of a, a much broader question that myself and I think Christina's been taking a look at a little bit as well. Uh, really trying to figure out what is at the core of the difference uh, across racial and ethnic groups and, and their co-ethnic or co-racial uh, representatives, that is you know, African-American or Latino representatives, and what kind of difference do they make. Um, so at the core of the, of the findings really is this question of, well, you know, once, once they get into office, right, how do these representatives behave and do they behave differently or are they motivated by different sources? And so the core of this study really was taking a look at a broad ideological spectrum. Democrats and Republicans certainly differ. Um, and the question really what we were looking at was this question of how do uh, black or Latino minority representatives more generally uh, draw on different cues, different backgrounds, different perspectives, shared experiences with their, uh, with their constituents to make decisions about how to go about representing those interests. And is this beyond ideology, because in the wrangell Espiot race, for example, there's hardly an issue that they disagree on in terms of what they might be asked to vote on as 
members of the House of Representatives. So were you measuring something beyond ideology? Right. Well, it's a tricky, it's a tricky question. So what we were trying to measure, we took a look at ideology, and what we found was essentially the absence of ideology um, when African American representatives were taking a, or were voting on or, or advocating for African American interests. And we measured that by taking a look at uh, NAACP ratings and issues they thought were important. Um, and Latino representatives sought out something outside of the traditional ideological spectrum when taking a look at uh, advocating for Latino interests. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a second dimension we think that's out there. Um, and really is based on on something else that political scientists haven't really discovered. And to be quite frankly, our, st our study hasn't really been able to pinpoint all of those, although a number of scholars have been taking a look at those issues. Professor Greer, how do you see the wrangle espionage race in this respect? Is it beyond ideology? And if they get into office, uh, whichever one is elected, do you think they would actually do something differently that would either more represent the black population or the Dominican population, or is it totally a matter of perception? Well, it's a few things. We know that the first order of business for any elected official is to get elected and then get reelected. So what we're seeing here with Wrangell is a, a classic case of he needs to get reelected, and Espiat is essentially trying to get that first election. So we also know that this particular district, 13, is extremely democratic. So we um, essentially have a one-party system, in, and we see this around the country, but we definitely have a one-party system in District 13. The primary is the election. The primary is completely the election, which we'll get to turn out pretty soon, I'm sure. So we know that with Wrangell and Espaillat, um, the, the homogeneity ideologically between those two um, is pretty, pretty strong. The devil is in the details. But we do know that for many districts across the country, people aren't necessarily interested in the details. So then we have to start looking at other items that can pull people to the polls, especially in a June election, as opposed to just a November election, since it's all about the primary. So this is where we start splitting hairs, if you will, and looking at descriptive representation, because the substantive representation is pretty, pretty much the same between the two candidates. And so that goes to the subtitle of uh, of your journal article, Professor, right? Descriptive representation. Right. Tell us more about what that is and also what you call ideological cueing. Right. And so, and so political scientists and theorists have, have really pulled apart two types of representation, among many others. Um, substantive representation, as Professor Greer has uh, mentioned, is this, is this concept of representing interest and policy preferences, I think, in the most general sense. Um, descriptive representation is this notion that uh, legislators ought to reflect the racial or ethnic or gender, um, religious, you know, as we, we broaden the scope, um, backgrounds of their constituents. So descriptive representation really talks about mm -hmm. uh, individuals that look like or um, have, have the same types of backgrounds as their constituents. And so let, so, me, let me go back to Professor Greer on this. Is this a matter then of a, if you will, low information voter? somebody who's turning out without a lot of knowledge about different issues or how these different candidates might behave in Congress and just sort of seeing names that seem like people like me um, and voting at a level of comfort rather than a level of information? I think it's not necessarily an either or. I think it can be both, actually, right? We know that w these candidates across the country definitely have strong bases that turn out. But it's the ways in which people talk about politics that let us know that they actually do know what's going on. You know, and oftentimes these communities are the miners' canary. They can tell you that the economy is going south well before the economic indicators can. And anybody who votes in a June primary for one seat exactly. probably is very politically engaged to begin with Ex and knows something. Exactly. And they may not necessarily articulate it in the way that political scientists um, speak about it, but they know about the, the needs and wants of a community. So the difference is I always try and explain to my students is, you know, every community wants safe streets and good schools, right? It's the difference between which community gets them and which communities don't. But these communities are very aware that there are inequities in education. They're very aware that there are inequities in sort of police uh, stop and frisk and police brutality, how their streets look, how their potholes are filled. All of these quality of life and economic issues are clearly articulated by these populations. It's just, can they get someone in office who can fight for 
what they want, right? And so, unfortunately, many times, there's a protectionist phase that stays there as opposed to an expansionist phase. So if you have a, an elected official that's doing a relatively good job, stick with that person because you never know what the other person will or will not do for you particularly. So let me ask you both to wrap up. Can a case be made? Does your research indicate, for example, one way or another, Dr. Preuss, that people who vote for people who are ethnically like them do get better representation, more effective representation on the safe streets and good schools and those nuts and bolts issues that Professor Greer was just referring to, um, even when their opponent ideologically agrees with them once they're elected? Sure, and, and I think one of the things to keep in mind is that you know, the, the voters are, are, are using some of these cues, these racial ethnic background cues and names, um, to make a, a decision, but those decisions actually do have uh, important effects. And so we see both in terms of the types of issues that are being addressed, uh, the amount of attention being given to particular issues, um, and within the community perspective, you know, we, we live in a society where it's not just congressional districts, but certainly within neighborhoods that differences and uh, focus can, can matter. So uh, yeah, voters are, are making decisions. They may not, they may be making decisions on, on fairly uh, basic uh, points, but at the same time, uh, those decisions have real consequences. Do they get different representation? I think it's hard to just paint a, a wide brush, right? Because we also have to look at the types of races and the histories of the various districts, because we do know that there are different conversations that happen when it's a uh, a candidate of color versus someone who's white, right? We do know that whites will vote for whites as well. But there are specific issues that are raised in each um, every two years, sort of each election cycle, that can change uh, the level of participation and the level of interest. Um, and so people can uh, rank their priorities differently, right? And so what may be a priority this particular election cycle may not necessarily be a priority in the next uh, election cycle. And this can range from race and ethnicity to actual pocketbook issues. So for example, in this election cycle, immigration reform may be a huge issue between 2014 and 2016. Maybe an espiot would be more of a leader on that because he sees that as appealing to his base, even if Rangel would agree with him on the issue? Right, or um, some people may feel threatened about immigration being a leading issue and they would choose to vote for Rangel, right? And that doesn't necessarily fall as neatly along racial and ethnic lines as, as we sometimes think that they Well, do. thank you both for joining us. Okay. Well, thank you. And that's our program for today. You'll find a new show here each week at this hour. Next time, Syrian women across sectarian lines. They are demanding both an end to sexual violence as a weapon of war and a role in the peace process. And tune into my radio program, 10 o'clock weekday mornings on WNYC, 93.9 FM and AM820. Tomorrow, the author of a book called Our Transgender Bodies, Our Transgender Selves. I'm Brian Lehrer. Thanks for watching. Thank you.